Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, a hands-on software architect, and also the founder of a website, developer2architect.com. It's been quite a journey through Software Architecture Monday, and we've made it to lesson number 100. Entering into the triple digits, I decided that this was kind of a special lesson, a special time. I never even dreamed I would hit 100 lessons in Software Architecture Monday. And so I decided to do something special. And I really decided to take a step back from all the, the technical and process stuff and really talk about my architecture journey and the corresponding lessons learned during that journey that I can actually share with you. So let's start at kind of the beginnings. I started my career as an astronomer working for an observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona in the United States. We were chartered at the observatory for looking for black holes, variable stars, and binary star systems. And my role at the observatory was not only as an observational astronomer, but since I had a degree in mathematics and computer science, I also uh, did a lot of work with telescope automation, programming in C language on Apple IIe's, um, rotating the dome to match the telescope, uh, slewing the telescope, meaning moving the telescope automatically to various stars, um, also, uh, automatically or programmatically changing the filter um, we used for photometry on the telescope. And we had to usually manually rotate that. And also, finally, uh, what we called the reduction of all of the data into actual information. Well, I found out through those beginnings that while I was really fascinated with astronomy, my real passion lied in programming. And so I started my career actually in C language, but then moved over to mainframe systems. I got a job at a very large bank and that's kind of what started my career full time as a programmer. I worked in mainframes for many, many years. Those of you with uh, as much gray hair as I do re probably recognize this ISPF screen. Um, this led me to my very first job as a software architect. This was in the early 90s. And my first role after I gained the title of application architect was a very large conversion project, project from Honeywell assembler language into COBOL on an IBM mainframe. And there was a tricky part to this particular project because there was no documentation about the existing system, which meant that we had to extract business rules from Honeywell assembler language. Now, I will say it was a very hard project technically, but we did complete the project in time, within budget, and zero defects. However, and this project led to my very, very first and perhaps most important lesson learned in my entire career. And that was this, folks. My lesson learned through this was that I alienated almost everybody on that project. My abrasiveness, um, my unwillingness to deal with people um, actually led to folks um, from actually leaving the company as a direct result of my abrasive actions. And my valuable lesson learned was the fact that soft skills, or what do you want to call them, people skills, matter in software architecture. It's a big part of being a software architect. That collaboration, that mentoring, that coaching, that facilitation, I didn't see that aspect of software architecture. There was no one to tell me, by the way, Mark, being a software architect is more than just knowing a lot of technology. You have to also deal with people. I had to learn that the hard way. And now I can convey that to you. Half, in my opinion, of being a software architect are those people skills and soft skills. Well, I continued my journey with this new lesson learned, um, being able to collaborate and really learning how to work with people until I ended up on a very large government project. And I was the lead architect, the chief architect on this particular project, which was a rewrite of this particular government agency's core system. And we had a lot of requirements. 
high availability, high performance, high reliability, high observability, concurrency, elasticity, high data integrity needs, high security, high scalability. As a matter of fact, um, pretty much the joke was take any illity, what we used to call them back then, now I call them architecture characteristics, and add the word high to it. This was quite a challenging project. As a matter of fact, uh, a lot of you probably have heard of a ship called the Vasa. If you haven't, V-A-S-A, -S I would encourage you all to kind of Google that. Um, however, I rolled up my sleeves and it took me several months, but I created what I thought was the perfect architecture. Through scenarios driven through ATAM, Architecture Trade-Off Analysis Method, I was able to demonstrate every single one of those architecture characteristics through the architecture. And as a result of this fine effort, I almost lost my job because we folks in the consulting firm I was working with lost this valuable project. Why? Because while I thought this was the perfect architecture, the problem is it was tens of millions of dollars over budget. And this, folks, was another valuable lesson learned in my journey as an architect. And that is always take feasibility into account. Those times about constraints, about cost and time and budget and skill staff, or the, 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 the skill of the staff, all of those together count as terms of feasibility. As a matter of fact, um, even to this day of the recording, um, feasibility is still my number one favorite architecture characteristic. And that was a very valuable lesson learned. Of course, all through my career as an architect, I've been make, making a lot of diagrams. I've been doing a lot of architectures, working with a lot of companies. And this led uh, to my third big lesson learned in software architecture. You see, I would draw diagrams like this and you can see how this works. As a matter of fact, even through the workflow numbering, you can see how a ticket is created, assigned, routed, notified, completed, a customer survey. But the problem is this. People would start to ask me, well, I, I see how this works, but why did, you, why did you create only one service for assignment and routing? Why not split those into two? Um, why is the completion a synchronous call, whereas assign, notify, and survey all asynchronous calls? As a matter of fact, here you have choreography. Um, why didn't you just do orchestration? You see, my epiphany when the light bulb went off in software architecture and my third lesson learned was really so powerful, Neil Ford and I coined it in our book as the second law of software architecture. Now, the first law of software architecture we coined in the book is that everything in software architecture is a trade-off. But the second law of software architecture in 2011 was my epiphany, my third lesson learned, and that was the why is more important than the how. It was the missing link in my journey as an architect to really truly understand architecture. You see, a diagram I can look at and it conveys the how. I can read a, a manual about how to connect things together. But what I was missing as a software architect, even with those other two lessons learned, is the reason why I made certain decisions. And again, it was so powerful. We did coin this as the second law. Understanding why you made a decision becomes more important than how it actually works. Now, about six years ago, enter in microservices, which I jumped immediately on the bandwagon to. And as all of you who are listening, who have experienced microservices know, that this architectural style turned our world upside down. It became so complicated, so many pitfalls, so many anti-patterns. And as a matter of fact, out of the six years I've been helping companies move to microservices, 
migrate from monolithic applications or service-oriented architectures or even greenfield, there was a valuable lesson learned out of this journey so far in microservices. And that lesson learned was this, don't get caught up in the hype. So many companies that I've worked for in the past six years in microservices, I've leveraged my prior lesson learned, my epiphany, the why is more important than the how, and actually started my consulting engagements by asking companies, why are you moving to microservices? And realizing that there are some superpowers within this architecture style, but also a lot of Achilles heels, drawbacks, and really helping companies understand, let's avoid the hype, let's avoid jumping on the bandwagon and really understand which portions of applications would benefit from microservices and which ones wouldn't. You know, throughout my career, um, I've been speaking at a lot of, consult, uh, of, of conferences and user groups. As a matter of fact, 15 years I've been speaking on the No Fluff Just Stuff, no Fluff, Just Stuff Tour, NFJS, uh, here in the United States. As a matter of fact, I've spoken at hundreds of conferences and user groups across the world. I loved speaking. I loved evangelizing this knowledge. And about five years ago, I started to transition my career from doing less consulting and more training. As a matter of fact, the very first training I ever offered, and this was through No Fluff Just Stuff, was the fundamentals of software architecture. And this has really evolved since five years ago. But I have trained hundreds and hundreds of people in kind of the fundamentals and aspects of software architecture, knowledge that I had. And what I gained to come to realize in my journey as an architect, in this transition from doing less consulting, which I still do, but less consulting and more training, was this lesson learned. After 36 years of being in this industry and 26 as an architect, and that lesson learned, folks, was that spreading knowledge is more valuable than being an individual contributor. Now, what I realized was I've got all this knowledge through all of my experiences at client sites and companies doing projects. And I had it all bottled up. And while I was really well, really good at helping teams as an individual contributor, I wasn't really evangelizing all of my knowledge. And that was really, so far, mm, my current lesson learned in the software architecture. As a matter of fact, uh, that comes full circle into that spreading knowledge is so much more valuable. And so three years ago, I did start my website, developer2architect.com, that you're listening to right now with Software Architecture Monday. All sorts of articles, books, uh, videos, uh, resources to help everyone in this journey for free from this transition from developer to software architect. Spreading that knowledge is so much more valuable for me now. Keeping current is also valuable, which I still do consulting engagements, but they're fewer and I actually enjoy the training now. That mentoring, that coaching, kind of giving back all this experience that I've learned. So folks, that is so far my architecture journey. It's not over. I have many, many, many more years to contribute to this industry, but I'm, I wanted really to share some of those core lessons learned to kind of help you as a, a software architect, as a developer going to become a software architect, uh, to really think upon some of those lessons learned and leverage those as a catalyst to boost your career a little further. I hope you enjoyed this special lesson number 100. Uh, starting in two weeks, we'll be back on our regular two-week cadence, starting at lesson 101, uh, which I will talk about some aspect of software architecture. Until then, please, everybody, stay safe. And thank you so much for listening and uh, being a part of uh, developer2architect.com and especially Software Architecture Monday. Uh, thank you all so much. Bye-bye.